Uh, hello, students of CPTI. Lecture, let's see, six begins. <laughs> Already lecture six. Well, uh, let's go to the PowerPoint. Um, as always, wow. Uh, lecture six on one of my favorite topic. So Holy Spirit God, we ask for your favor and your anointing today that we may really grasp the truth today and that we could be um, one who leads the way for Cambodian leaders and next generation. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, round of applause. Baksu. Um, Last lecture, we start talking about epistemology and ontology, how knowing is the same thing as being. What you know, you need to practice. And that's like a, a Christian understanding. Uh, I know, when I, when I use yin yang like that, people say, are you Buddhist? And no, no, I'm just using the symbolism of Dr. Damien So. And I start talking about how I began my journey as a, a Fuller student, MDiv, uh, getting MDiv since 86. I was so excited because I would be learning under Colin Brown and he's a phenomenal theologian, great man of God. And so I was so excited attending his class because I read his book, he's a philosopher too, Philosophy and Faith. That's the book I read when I was undergrad. It's like I was 18, 19. I read it, I was so blessed. I said, I want to learn under him. So when I went to his uh, systematic theology, uh, he introduced his systematic theology as well. The systematic theology should be rational, where it's got to be analytically structured, the Trinity, anthropology, epistemology, cosmology, ecclesiology, soteriology, eschatology, all this basically out of the rationalism, right? Uh, that you're going to have a system of theology like that. So, I'm sure you learned systematic too. But I was there thinking, but that's not what I'm here for. And so I raised my hand. I said, sir, I have a question. I love my wife. Uh, and I, but my love for my wife is neither rational, logical, nor systematic. So when my love for my wife is irrational, spontaneous, and crazy kind of love, how come I have to love my God rationally, logically, systematically? So I said, I, I disagree. Um, I believe faith could be rational, not logical, and scattered. <laughs> and so uh, Professor Colin Brown said, oh, okay, Bob, you could do your irrational, not logical, and fragmented theology. And so I did 20 weeks I spent on my own and, uh, out of this outline and I came up with my own theology of irrational, not logical and fragmented theology. When I turned in my paper, he loved it. He gave me an A, he said, take another class under me. So I took systematic one and two under him, got A, but never went to class. Because I believe that, and, and, and this is not to say that irrational, not logical, scattered theology is better, greater than the rational, logical, systematic, or the rational, logical, systematic is greater. No, it's both and. You both need irrationalism. You also need rationalism. You need a Holy Spirit, uh, uh, not Holy Spirit, you need a uh, scatter, you need all put together. So it's not one is right and one is wrong, one is better and one is worse. No, it's we need both. But some stuff in the Bible is you cannot believe it. You cannot rationally make it happen. How could a virgin have a child? Right? How could a virgin have a child without having sexual intercourse? That's not possible. But we say, well, you know, but uh, faith can be uh, rash rational and we could explain this phenomenon. I said, no, I don't have to explain. You just got to believe. If you believe because it's reasonable, that's an agreement not faith. So I believe the rational stuff 
needs to be believed. So both systematic theology and fragmented theology has its place. And within the systematic theology, you have to allow fragmented theology to be part and systematic theology and part of the fragmented theology. So it's both and as Dr. Damien so constantly saying, epistemology is almost ontology, almost. So it has to mingle together. So what I know and what I do, what I believe and who I am has to be all worked together. Okay. So I, 1986, I said, give me yellow theology. And uh, by 2016, Fuller, they said, okay, we're gonna do global theology. What is global theology? Basically for 2000 years, it's been Western centric, Western led theology. From 2016, they said, okay, well, let China come in, Korea come in, Asia come in, and let's do global theology. No, I think it's yellow theology. Because we have 2000 years of Western theology already. So wh why am I passionate about this? Well, because um, um, when we talk about Greek philosophy, and this comes from more the philosophical background. Now, um, if you don't understand this, you don't have to fully understand, but you just have to understand, ah, that's why, right? It, I'm gonna skim, in a way, skim. You don't have to be a philosophy major, you know, study philosophy for four years, but you know Plato, right? And you know Aristotle, right? And, and if you say that, oh, I just wanna th study theology, so I don't wanna learn philosophy, then you're making a huge error. You cannot study theology without understanding philosophy because I'm going to explain. The Greek philosophy, philosophic tradition influenced by Socrates as presented by Plato. So Plato and Socrates are what we call Greek philosophy. But Hellenistic philosophy is a period of Western philosophy that was developed in the Hellenistic civilization following Aristotle and ending with the beginning of Neoplatonism. So basically, in Greek philosophy was crafted by Socrates, and Socrates' disciple was Plato. And Socrates never wrote a book, he just taught. You know, he was sort of like guru, mentor, you know, and walking and Plato, right? And so Plato started a school in public, right? Academic public. And Aristotle was a student there. But then Aristotle, decide to go against Plato. It's a whole philosophical system. Now, they lived 500 BC, right? I mean, before Jesus was born, 500, 469, Socrates already was talking, teaching, and Plato, 429 BC, he was working. And Aristotle, of course, comes later as a student, right? So Aristotle was only 17 when he meets Plato at age 62. And yet as he gets older, he realized that's not what I believe. And he started his own philosophical tree. So um, let's go back to this. You know, this is a, the picture of Europe. And so in the Europe was basically ruled by Greek and Hellenistic philosophy, right? Let's zoom in. So you know the story of Paul. Paul wanted to actually go to go through Asia. That's where he wanted to go. But the Bible says in book of Acts, Holy Spirit stopped him. The spirit of Jesus stopped him. Spirit of God stopped him. And then there was a Macedonia call, right? So he said, okay, I need to go Macedonia. So he took a trip there. Um, and so he went there instead of the other way. So if he went through the other side from there, let me go back. From there, he went to the other side. He will come through Iran, Turkey, Pakistan, China, India, like that. And then reach Cambodia through China. Wow, they will be radically different, right? Radically different. But as he did that, he wrote all the Bible. So Apostle Paul wrote all the Bible, most of the Bible, but it was under the umbrella of what? Greek and Hellenistic philosophy. What I mean by that? That's the frame. That's the frame of how we understand Bible. That's how Paul wrote understanding. So everything that he wrote was based on that. So as you know, the birthplace of Christianity is not West. 
the birthplace of Christianity is actually Asia, right? It's closer to Asia than Europe. But because he took the gospel to Macedonia and from there to Europe, the, everything that he wrote became framed and understood in epistemological understanding of the West. Okay, what is a frame of reference? Do you see star here? Yes, of course. You see triangle? Yes. Do you see diamond? Yes. Okay. Well, this is a frame of reference. And when you make a frame of reference like that, and that frame of reference becomes big, well, what do you see? I don't see anything. Why? Because your frame of reference is blocking the reality that was presented. So when you have a Western philosophical frame of reference, then you don't see any of the shapes that you saw before, because it's out of your frame. So that's what theory of knowledge is, is epistemology. Epistemology is, means, how do I know that, you know, so we have a Greek philosophy fighting the Hellenistic philosophy, not even Greek fighting is, Greek philosophy fighting Hellenistic view. How do I know what I know? And they are constantly battling each other. And the, the battle that they had was a frame of reference. And, and so we just, we're fighting the battle that the Eastern mind doesn't even care. For example, if Paul had went to, through China instead of going to Europe, and then all the frame of reference would be great Chinese philosophy and Cambodian philosophy and Korean philosophy. So the understanding of the Bible will be also framed in the Eastern philosophy. So don't ever say that, oh, I don't study philosophy. I just study theology. You cannot study theology without philosophy. And which philosophy, philosophical basis you are under dictates it's called insignon or epistemology, epistemology, which is to know, recognize knowledge theory. So how do you recognize? This is how Chinese put it. Simple. Well, you don't read Chinese, right? Neither do I read Chinese. So let's translate that. It means truth and belief and the knowledge, knowing is in the middle. It's both and balanced. For Chinese philosophic understanding, truth or the knowing, how do I know? Well, there's a truth. And there's my belief about the truth. And knowing is somewhere in between. It's both and, and balanced. That's why I said Dr. Damien So's epistemology is almost ontology makes sense. It's both and. So I'm presenting this concept to the philosophy departments and as Cambodia celebrate Day of Philosophy on the third, I think, third Thursday or second Thursday of November is always International Day of Philosophy. They invited me as a speaker at RUPP uh, and had all the philosophy students and professors from Cambodia, or professors of philosophy from Cambodia. And they did a whole lecture series through me and which was, I was very honored. They even put a, a poster. I wish I took that poster. <laughs> but uh, my students, formal students and current students were there. Um, and it was fantastic, right? It was fantastic. Now, so the philosophy uh, is important because how you perceive reality is going to dictate what you do. What do I mean by that? If you have a philosophy or have a culture or the, your understanding of church in Cambodia is, well, Cambodia church will never become self-sustainable, will never become financially independent. If that's what your faith, that's what you believe, that's what you know. No meaning that the reality may be different, but no reality and your, your belief, for example, the truth may be different that maybe it was not meant for Cambodian church not to be financially independent, but true. But that you, your faith, your belief, that I believe that Cambodian church cannot be financially independent, then 
That's your knowledge. That's your epistemological standing. That's your position, right? So when that happens, what happens is that you are going to uh, basically give yourself to the norm of the day. So when you turn to this book, page 23, now, let's go there. I write, the background, research background is that there were 2,500 evangelical churches in Cambodia. But only about 10 churches are financially independent. I would like to find out why. So my research began because I want to understand the reality that I was hearing from. It may not even be true. You may even know more churches. But at the time when I started research, I only knew of. And then I, after interview, literally 20, 30, 40 pastors in Cambodia. I said, do you know of any Cambodian church that was financially independent? Oh, yeah, not really. And some people say, oh, yeah, most churches are independent. I said, how? He said, well, you know, there's a family of five, you know, like a pastor, his wife, and three children, and his uncle and his niece. And, you know, they meet in the living room, and there are about 10 people. They don't really need finance, so they're financially independent. No, that's, that's not even church, you know, according to the definition of church per se, right? When two and three are gathering name, I will be with you. But it's not established church. When we do research in church, we don't call that church. We call that small group, right? So you may have 2,500 small group, may not even be a church. But anyways, we don't, in Cambodia, we cannot even define what church is yet. So we got a long way to go. But anyways, that's how I began my research. And all of the Indochina church are experiencing similar crisis. I would like to share my findings with Cambodian missionaries, pastor with other Indochina countries. Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, and Thailand. Okay, and then why was I motivated to do that? Well, because I was part of church planting of 27 churches in Siberia, GMI. And 2003, I was uh, lecturing at uh, Moscow uh, Bible College. And there's a, in Moscow, in Russia, and there's a Bible College. And I was preaching there, teaching there, book on Revelation. And they said, Pastor O, we planted 100 churches in Siberia, and they all closed down. I said, why? Well, because money ran out. I said, what does money running, what, what, money running out and church closing down? I said, well, without money, you cannot do church. I said, really? OK, so why don't we go plant a church? So we went and, and planted 27 churches, the Bible students, and, and we supported them two years uh, financially. And then third year, fourth year, we stopped. All these churches, so we started 2003. Wow, <laughs> you see that couple? Uh, wow, these are beautiful people that I work with since 2003. So how many years is that? Many years, right? Almost 20 years. And every year I will go Russia twice a year, one time to train, one time to cry together. And these are 2000 and then 2018 were there again. Wonderful, wonderful people. These will tell us about this. Uh, uh, Ole and Irina. Ole and Irina. The man's name is Ole and Irina. They are church planter and um, they went to a little village in Russia. Um, there was only about 2,000 people living in this little village. Only 2,000 people. I know it seems a lot. In, in Cambodian context, you know, 2000, because Cambodia villages are smaller, a right? group of 200. But they are not a farmers, they don't farm. So they gather you know, together with industry. But it's a small town of 2000. They have no university, they have no school for their children. So when they went there, and, and the Irina was crying, and she said, Pastor O, uh, I'm going to educate my children in this, in this village of 2000. They have no university here. I said, I'm so sorry. Uh, if God calls you there, you have to go. So we, I visited their house uh, visit and preached for them. And in order for me to go to his village, I had to fly from LA, 13 hour flight to Moscow. And then from there, another six hour to Kranos. From there, I had to take a bus, a 12 hour. I mean, it took like three days to get there. And nothing. They were like 80% of the men in the city were alcoholics. 80%. Can you believe 80% of men in your city being alcoholic? No hope whatsoever. And then 
the power of God just work and they, because they have this witch in, in their village, the witch, like they would go to this village and they train to plant a church. And every morning there were like six eggs. So they thought, oh, they are far, they're farmers. They're giving us some uh, eggs every morning. After about a week, the, basically the witch of the village met them at the market and said, oh, you still didn't die. Well, what do you mean? I cursed those eggs and I was giving the eggs to you to die. But you ate those eggs and you still survived. Wow, right? So I asked them, what did you do next day when you saw six eggs? What do you mean? We prayed over it and we ate it for breakfast. So the news got around saying that, oh, there's even stronger than our witch is here. So they become Christian, become leaders. So this meeting, 2018, after how many years? You know, almost... Uh, we started 2003, so wow, well, 15 years later, six, you know, 14 years, 15 years later, we met and Irina was crying and hugged me and said, Pastor o, our kids were young, there was no university, but because they didn't have university, they end up going to university in Moscow. Now they married a lawyer, they married a doctor and, and they are serving the Lord together. I mean, right? And all these churches, Beautiful gal, she used to be such a sweetheart. And this couple, one, she's a Korean Russian, and the other is Belarusian Russian, and they married, and they now raising eight children. Eight children. I said, well, How do you have eight children? I said, well, they start a church in Siberia, and then it was, you know, it's so cold there. They drink vodka and they become alcoholic, drug addicts, and, and they start having baby and the parents die. They have a baby, but parents die of alcoholism. So they start adopting these kids, the parents die. And they now have eight kids. They plant a beautiful church and give it to his disciple and then moved away. Three day drive. You have to drive three days to get to this place to worship with us. He drove three out, three days to see us and just loving the Lord, right? All the church survived. They're financially independent. None of them needs finance. One other church, the found, they actually built this church after how many years? And there are so many leaders they are raising. They, they not only survived, but they planted 10 church on their own. There are like hundreds of people just worshiping the Lord. Now, how come in Siberia, I mean, so cold, so difficult, so harsh, you know, <laughs> And they're all surviving and they're all financially becoming dependent. How come not in Cambodia? Right? How come you cannot do that in Cambodia? Right? So I took that question to Oxford Center for Mission Study and started learning patron client relationship. And I started writing the thesis, right? And I finally finished my doctoral thesis. And I passed my oral exam and graduated, right? So um, my, my point is that when we, when we keep on saying that, well, this cannot be done, this cannot be done, and it will never be done, never be done. Uh, and it's so sad that uh, many, many decades of missionary work that without financial support, church cannot survive. And I, I really think it's a challenge. Oh, 70%. 70% of Korean churches also not financially independent. So I'm not asking like all of you to go and plan a church and become financially independent next year. No, of course not, that's not possible. But that's the goal toward in which that we need to move forward. If Korea didn't have a goal to become independent, then it will still be 3%, not 30% independent. So that's what I mean. We need to make effort, we need to strategize, we need to plan, we need to an effort to make our churches plant it, let it grow, and let it become financially independent so that you don't need missionary support, whether finance, even theology, even in leadership, that you become self-governing, self-sustainable, self-propagating church. And that's my, my vision. And well, well, how do you get there? Well, you have to have a legitimate research and you research on your own, Research the books, research the field, go to Kampong Chong, Kampong Trang, 
Koko, Mandurgiri, Ratanagiri, and compare the churches, who's doing well, you know, church in Phnom, the Phnom people in Mandurgiri are self-sustaining. They are doing well. They're financially blessing. They're overflowing. I said, well, why can't Cambodians do this? You know, I, I had a disciple that I trained uh, for almost now, close to 20 years. No, since 2007, so 13, 14 years. He was a college student. Now he's a medical doctor. He's a dentist. And so he said, Pastor o, how come all my friends who, you know, went to Bible college and become a pastor, how come they constantly talk about being sponsored by someone uh, to, to a church? Is that normal in other countries? I said, no, that's not normal. I plan five churches in LA and I have to struggle financially. I have to work. I have to, I have to work as a translator. I have to work and I was involved in a business and, and, and I didn't have to ask for support. How come a lot of people, a lot of pastor friends I have, they always talk about me support, me support, me support. So why is that? I would like to know. And that's the research that I think you should all be engaged in so that we could really find solution to that together. In order for that to happen, you need a research, you need legitimate research study that you cannot rely on foreigners. You cannot rely on Koreans. You cannot rely on American to do research for you because they, they have their own perspective. They only understand this. And so I, I pray that you can expand your capacity to learn and you can actually do it on your own. Amen. Good. Well, um, I pray that uh, this lecture was uh, meaningful and helpful. And we're going to continue with uh, the uh, now analyzing or isolating and actually working with your paper. Okay, well, see you at the next lecture then. Bye.